All right, welcome to our class tonight. Of course, our Facebook Live audience is real. And we're still talking about the churches. We are on the fourth church tonight in Revelation. And we're going to be looking at Revelations chapter 3, 1 through 6. And this church is a little bit different, and you'll see as we get into the study tonight, it's a little bit different than the other three in the way that God, de or he describes these churches. So pay attention to what he says about these churches that was different from the other three churches. Okay, and as we mentioned before, when you, when you look at these churches and you study them, just remember everything that was prophesied to them has already happened to them. Meaning that if they received the advice that the Lord gave them, then they already have overcome and they received their rewards. If they didn't, then what he said was going to happen, happened to them. So when you read these churches in Revelation, just remember it's not talked about churches today. And it's not talking about churches in the future. This has already happened. It was a prophetic word for these seven churches. Uh, and you say, well, why are we studying them? We're talking about the end times. Well, the same spirit that was going on in these churches is relevant in the churches today. We deal with the very same situations, the very same circumstances so what we need to do is we need to look at how God sees it. What I appreciate about these seven churches, we see how God looks at things that are not right in his church. Um, you know, too many times we feel like that, that God has left running the church up to man. But God's actively involved in the church. He really is. And he's watching. He's observing. And there are a lot of things in the church that I think need to be dealt with but I know for a fact that may, man may not ever deal with it, but God will. And here's proof that God's paying attention to the churches. So just remember, you can get frustrated, you can get aggravated with leadership and all kind of things in the church, but just remember, Jesus is still head of the church. And he's running things. Uh, he's using men and women to bring things where they need to come. But also, if a man don't do what man needs to do, God will come in and take take authority over it and deal with it. But these spirits, the devil, Jezebel spirit, all these different spirits are still alive today. I don't know whether believers really understand this or not, but angels can't die. That means that the fallen angels, they're still alive. They, they can't die. God created hell because <clears throat> angels can't die. Does that mean the same spirit that was dealing with man and with the church back some 2,000 years ago, those same spirits are relevant today. They're working in the church today. So what are we going to do about it? You know, we, we, we say, well, you know, we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to change this, and we need to change that. But you need to understand, in order to know what to properly do, we need to study these churches. See what God said to them, what God saw, what they were doing wrong and make sure we don't do it. And then recognize that God is still head of the church. And one scripture that comes to mind when you're thinking about these churches and us today is 2 Peter 3. It says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to, to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So as we're looking and reading about these churches, remember that God is long suffering. He, his end game, his end goal is that we all repent. And sometimes even today we feel like, you know, why is there not any recompense for what's going on today or around us? Why is the Lord not doing anything? Well, it's because he's long suffering and he wants to give us a chance. Not just our enemies, not just our neighbors, but everybody. He wants them to have an opportunity. So remember that. But it also says in the scripture that he is not slack concerning his promise. So all the promises, even the ones that have a bad end to it, you know, the ones that the, the sowing and reaping principle, even the things we sow, we're going to reap. But remember, God is not slack concerning his promise for these churches. And we have to remember the results of what our disobedience brings as well. So we're looking at the Sardis church. When you look at this particular church, recognize right away that there's not a lot of good things to be said about this church. This particular church, the Lord could not start with something positive. Now that's sad because we have somebody of believers today that the Lord is completely not pleased with. And we wonder sometimes, well, what he's going to do about it. And we study this 
it gives us a hint as to how God sees things. You know, there's so many doctrines, so many teachings in the church that we really don't understand because we're really allowing uh, the commandments of man and the different uh, traditions and customs of man to pollute the word. But when you go to the naked, unadulterated word, you begin to realize right away that, you know what? God still got his church. The church is going to be triumphant. And a lot of the times we look at different denominations, we look at different groups of believers, and we say, well, they can't be of God, they're, or they're not going to make it in. One prerequisite, and I've said this before, do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Because if you believe that, that Jesus is Lord, there's hope. There's hope. When you go into a church or into a ministry, and they say, well, the Lord you know, the Lord is just a, 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 a master or a good teacher, but he's not the son of God. I will tell you to run. Don't walk. Run. Get up out of there. Because Jesus is the son of the living God. And he is the only way to be saved. There's a lot of creative wisdom and man's understanding, but he's the only way. This church at Sardis was what they classified as a miserable church. Why were they miserable? Because they had completely forsaken the will and the purpose of Christ in the church. And it's miserable. When you begin to examine life, I don't care what you've got in this life. If you don't know Christ, there's a bunch of miserableness that's on the way if it's not already there. Because he's the king. He's the one that we have got to examine. It. And he said it this way. He said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. He said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. So you see, we need to know him. One thing that I appreciate about the Lord is he can be known. You know, man may not know him. Your leader may not know him. Many folk that you deal with may not know him, but that does not keep you from knowing him. You just have to put forth the extra effort to know him. But this Sardis church, if you look at that very uh, first verse of this third chapter, you'll find that, that, that God comes to this church in a unique way like he did all the rest of them. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things said he that had the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Remember that in the, the uh, second chapter, he, he gave us an understanding of those cells, the first chapter, in the first chapter, he gave us an understanding of what these stars were. He said these represent the, the church. They represent, uh, and they were in his hand. Uh, so he said, and he was walking in the midst of the candlestick. So you see, all of this is church. So the Lord said, I'm coming to Sardis as a representative of all that the church is, should be, or ever will be. So we can learn a lot from this. In essence, God came to, to the church at Sardis as the head of the church. He came as the one who sets the order. He came as the one who straightens things out. That's why we need to make sure we've got leadership that's submitted to the Lord because we can't do it. I can tell you right now, there's absolutely no way you can run the church. I don't care what your position is or where you're at, no way you can run the church without Christ being in the center of your life. Oh, you can do a good job. Man's wisdom can do wonders in the world system and in organization. But remember, I said the church is not an organization. The church is an organism. And there's a big difference because what you can do in an organization, you can't do in an organism. You don't need love in an organization. You need order. But in an organism, all the members of a, a body work in love. My, if my right hand didn't love my left hand, then I'd be in trouble because if my right hand be slapping on him and kicking him. And if, if, if my, my left hand didn't like my eyes or didn't love my eyes, I'd be in trouble because he'd be punching them out. You know? So you see, an organism operates in the principle of love and an organization operates in the principle of, of man order or man's wisdom or man's understanding. Just remember, the church is not an organization. It may look like it. Man may try to structure it like it. But if it's going to be the church that Jesus is the head of, then it's going to be like your body. 
We are in reality the body of Christ. And we're not an organization, we're an organism. And that it goes way over the head of smart folk because they feel like, well, you've got to have order. But it's a different kind of order. The Lord said it this way. He said, you exercise authority whenever you're at the top in the world. But he said, in my kingdom, those that would be greatest among you must become the servants of all. Does that mean we become pushovers? No, but it means that our priority is to serve. That means that if you're a preacher, you're, you're not supposed to be up there trying to say I'm all of that in a bag of chips. You better listen to what I say or you're going to hell. That's not, that's not what leadership should be like. Well, leadership should be taking the head. We lead by example. What would happen in the body of Christ today if more of our leaders led by example? Meaning that instead of them coming and sitting back and relaxing while we sweep the the leaves up and clean the church. Oh, what about the preacher got in and helped us out? You know, he doesn't have to do it. But it's just a good a, a good uh, uh, example that you can set for doing things like that. Well, when you look at this particular church, it, uh, Jesus makes a point. He said, I'm coming as the head. I'm not coming as somebody you can play around with. I'm coming as the head. Look at, if you will, the, the, the next verse that goes a little deeper. He said, I know thy works that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and look at what he said, and art dead. He said, be watchful and strengthen things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. All the other churches, he first told them something positive, then he dealt with the negative. Here, there's nothing positive. He said, you, the only thing you got going for you is you, you think you're alive, but he said, you're really dead. Now, that's a powerful statement from God. Did you know that God does not need us to police his church? <clears throat> he polices his church. He knows who's right and who's wrong. We're not the judge. We're not the executioners. We're just the vessels that have the responsibility to show Christ in everything we do. And when you look at it, when it says, you know, you live life like, like you're alive, but you're really dead, it's in essence it's saying you had a reputation of life Yet in reality, dead or self righteous evaluation, meaning you uh, to you, you're right, but where everybody else is wrong, you have this self righteous attitude, and that's not wise. Of course, in 2 Corinthians 13, it talks about how you know it's not wise to compare yourself with others because you have to compare yourself to Christ. And I remember, you know, going even with Apostle Ruby we'll talking, and in my head, not that I, I did it on purpose, but he would tell me something, and he was like, You always say you might be right. And in my mind, I didn't get it, but in reality, I was saying, well, I hear you, but you're not right. I'm right. I'm always right. Because I would tell him, well, you might be right, just to give him a little bit of credit. But then when he kept telling me, he said, well, you actually say you might be right, taking away the fact that I'm right. So anyway, I had to realize that I need to check that to make sure that I'm not pushing aside what he's telling me because he is telling me the right thing. And in my mind, if I'm not careful, it'll bleed into my, my life in Christ. Meaning if somebody gives me some rebuke or the word rebukes me, I can't be like, well, Lord, you might be right. No, he is right. So again, we cannot be self-righteous, lining ourselves up with what we think. But what does the word of God say? And a lot of times we get that way because we're going off what, you know, we were taught that may not come from the Bible. It might have been just my denomination. And sometimes denominationalism teaches us things that are not in the Bible. Went through that too in my church. But again, we have to make sure that we're lining ourselves up with the word and we're not coming self-righteous. We look alive on the outside, but on the inside we're dying. You know, you're miserable. Everybody sees the, your, your flesh and your smile, but you're, you're dying. And we don't want to be like that in Christ. You know, a statement he made here, which is really interesting, he told me, he said, be watchful. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to be watchful? What does it mean to be watchful? Have you seen that in your Bible? Well, to be watchful means you take a spirit of prayer. Mm -hmm. It means you take a, a, a mindset of always praying. You know, we're, I was thinking about today, for example, and, and we've got some issues going on with our, our South African groups. And uh, I was praying, uh, I was first, I was just, just meditating on it. And the Lord just reminded me, said, well, you can talk to me about it. Because I felt like I said, Lord, I don't know how to express it the way it needs to be. He said, talk to me about it. You know, what I appreciate about God is you can talk to him, 
and, and he can straighten you up and he can rebuke you and he can do all kinds of things to you. But guess what? It's between you and God. Your greatest strength as a believer is being able to release to God. You know, I know you, you say, well, I, I need a psychiatrist. And I need somebody that I can talk to. But listen to me. I've never had God to take my side when I'm wrong. I've never had God to beat me up when I'm wrong. I've never had God to tell me things like, well, you know, you just need to go hang yourself. You know, you just. You. I've never had, when I talk to God, as I'm talking to him, I'm hearing what I'm saying to him, and he's correcting me on the inside. The greatest thing you can do as a believer is communicate with him. When I say communicate, do not try to have a special posture that you take. You know, when, you, when you're watchful, it means you're expecting to be careful in what you do. And that's the way we pray. Me, I'm, I'm old-fashioned. And I'm a little weird when it comes to prayer because for the first uh, 10 years of my, <clears throat> my life in Christ, I would walk because I always walked. Like we had we had farms uh, that we were working uh, on, and I would get up in the afternoons late, I would walk. You know, I would just get out and walk, look at the crops, see the corn coming up, the beans and all this kind of stuff, see what kind of birds are done some babies and the crops and all that. But I would walk. And it was so peaceful and so good. Well, when God saved me, I was a heathen. I didn't know nothing about praying. I didn't know nothing about the posture you're supposed to take. So I would get out every afternoon, late in the afternoon, and I would start walking. And I would start praying. Well, I had family. So my family, it was like I was neglecting them. So what I began to do was wait until they would go to sleep. Then when they would go to sleep, I would get out and I'd walk and I'd pray. And I did it for almost 10 years. That's what I did every night. And, and, and it, it was so peaceful because I had a lot of this situations and circumstances going on that I couldn't seem to get no understanding from anyone. But that's the key. If you want to know what is the greatest thing you can do, develop a prayer life. Now, I walked and I prayed with my eyes open. Because you can't pray when you're walking through the woods and around the fields at night with your eyes closed. <laughs> you know, you just don't do it. So I, I learned how to pray with my eyes open. I learned how when a deer would jump up or a snake or any wild creature, it wouldn't distract me from talking to God because I got used to it. But it, it caused me to be able to concentrate on the Lord with my eyes wide open. Even today, when I pray, sometimes I, I forget that most folks have to close their eyes to pray, you know, and they have to bow their heads. And sometimes you'll see me praying, my eyes are wide open. I pray with my eyes closed for everybody else's sake because I know some don't understand it. But you need to find out what works for you. Find out how you can talk to God all the time. The Bible says we're to pray without ceasing. That means we're to be watchful. Jesus said to them, he said, you know, he said, you need to get back on your watching. You need to get back on looking at what's going on. The greatest thing you can do as a believer is develop a strong prayer life with the Lord. And you don't have to go and hide in a closet to do it. You don't have to separate yourself from work to do it. Find a way to be creative. I would have to drive to work when I started doing public work. I'd pray on the way to work. Uh, when I, I would take a shower, I would be in the bathroom taking a shower and praying and talking to God. Uh, LT will tell you, I, there are times I would just holler out real low in life. Or, uh, I'd say something like, God help us. You know, she looked at me like, what's going on? I said, well, I'm just talking to the Lord. You know, I'll be, we'll be riding down the road and, and, and everything's right like quiet and, and, you know, everybody's focused on just getting where we're going. And I'll say something like, Lord have mercy, Lord God. You know, I, I just talk to him. And I want, and I realize that I'm, I'm in the car and I'm with somebody. And, you know, I said, well, I'm just, just 
calm it down. But but you need to have that kind of life. You know, I can tell you right now, with the things I've gone through in life, I've had folks that I couldn't talk to because they wouldn't understand. Who's going to understand times how you don't want to do God's will? You know, how you just, you know, you just want to give up. You want to let go. You want to say, well, I just, I'm just fed up. Who, who would understand? If I told LT all that stuff, she'd be like, oh, my God. Is he going to kill himself or what's going on? But I can tell God that. And while I'm talking to God, he encouraged me. Do you know what it's like to have the presence of God to just sit on you like a blanket? That's the only way I can describe it. It's like a blanket. It's like, have you ever had someone, I, I guess some may have, uh, had someone to come and just take a blanket you know, and wrap around you? Have you ever, ever had your mother do that to you or someone? Did you know that God would do the same thing? Somebody said, well, that, that's just your head. You, you know, you just imagine it. Well, you can say you can call it whatever you want to call it. I don't care. It don't matter to me because I know with me it's a comfort. With me it's a strength. With me, it's, it's God coming on the scene. And some would say, well, what do you do when everybody turns against you or folks lie on you or, or folks trying to tear you apart? Pray. Talk to God. When folks don't understand you, talk to God. And this is, this is good in marriages. Sometimes you don't need to talk to your, your, your mate if all you're doing is fussing. You know, why not talk to God and let God talk to your mate? And somebody said, well, that's kind of stupid. No, it's not. I can tell you right now that, that more wives have got husbands to do more things because they have prayed than any other time. Prayer still works. Yes, it does. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. It may seem like you're doing nothing, wasting time. Try it. I double dog dare you to try it. Because if you will try it, you will never be the same again. Nothing will get you down. Somebody said, well, 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 how do you get out of depression? Pray. Somebody said, well, how do you get out of suicidal thoughts? Pray. Somebody said, well, what do you do whenever it seems like folks you try to tell them they don't understand? God understands. And I'm telling you, I wish I could just, I wish I could explain it to you, but it's, it's hard. Because so many of God's people don't pray. They don't because they've been taught. You know, put your hands like this, bow your head, close your eyes. you got to be in a particular place. You know, the Lord said, go in your secret closet and pray. And, 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 um, and if you pray in, in secret, then God will reward you openly. But I've examined the life of Christ. Have you ever read how he prayed? The Bible said he would get away from everybody. He would go in the woods. I mean, but I told, I remember telling some of the brothers in, in church, and, and we would come together and we'd talk about what we do. doing. I would share with them that I was walking at night and praying at night and enjoying the Lord. And they said, you have lost your cotton-picking mind. <laughs> they said, who will get out in the dark and pray? But I'm not saying that that's your way. But I'm saying that's my way. But you need to find your way to be watchful. You need to find your way to maybe get yourself checked out by the Lord. And he'll do it. I'm telling you, if you ever get to that point where you make it a habit to find your way, your comfort zone with God, and pray. Talk to him. Somebody said, well, he won't talk back. Well, I tell you what. One night, I went out to pray with the Lord, and he talked the whole night. I mean, he told me to take a uh, He was talking too much. I just took a seat and sat down and listened to him. He talked, about, he talked about Adam. He talked about Eve. He talked about Abraham. He talked about Moses. He just gave me a lesson. And, and you said, well, well, how was it? it? I can't explain except the words just formed in my mind. It's like he was talking, and I could hear him, and he was sharing with me different things. And I would, I would think within myself, well, I wonder why he did this. And he said, I'll tell you why I did So you see, I didn't even have to talk. I could think, and he would actually share with me 
different things about the Bible. You say, well, how do you know it was God? Because I know the Bible. And what I did is I weighed everything that the voice was saying to me with the word, and it confirmed it line right up with the word. But it was special. And they finally began to get there, and I said, Lord, I said, Lord, let's get there. I got to get back. My family's going to get up. They're going to recognize I'm not, I've not been at home all night. And he said, well, okay, well, I knew you have, but let me tell you this. And him, I'm walking out of the woods trying to get to the house, and the Lord's still talking. Finally, finally, he just said to me, he said, okay, okay, we'll get together next time you're out. And I went on in the house, but I'll never forget that was the first time. And you're talking about, this was almost 30 years. Almost 30 years of my talking to God. And all of a sudden, this one night, he stayed with me and talked to me all night long. So you can't, now you can talk all you want to. Some folks say, I need to go to a psychiatrist. Some of them lost my mind. <laughs> you can say whatever you want to say. I don't care. Because I can tell you that God is real. And the reason we don't know him is we, we don't trust him enough to talk to him. Somebody said, well, I'm, I don't believe it takes all that. Well, if you don't believe it takes all that, then give God what it takes. You know, some folks they, they just say, well, you know, that's just, I, I do all my praying at the church. Well, the Bible says we're to pray without ceasing. That means always. You know, and you don't have to, some folks say, well, I don't believe any loans right now. Well, uh, just think about Peter. You know, he said a, a prayer for three words and got deliverance. How many of you remember that? He walked on the water, he began to sink, and he said what? What is what? Say? Lord save me, and God did. So you see, you don't have to say a lot of words. Somebody, don't let man put a pattern of prayer in you that you feel like you got to stick to. You find your own place in God. Find your own way to communicate with God. And but you have the same faith that God saved you with to communicate with Him. And you're going to find your life is never going to be the same. And they can push you down in life. They can walk all over you. But God is there to pick you up. So the next thing he tells them after he says be watchful, he says strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. Examine yourself and reinforce the sparks of righteousness that remain. And when you look at strengthening the things that remain, I think about, you know, the thing that got us to Christ in the first place, our faith. Strengthen your faith. There are times and moments that you're ready to give up as a positive plan that you're ready to just throw in the towel, but you got to strengthen your faith in that moment. And I remember seeing this video um, a couple weeks ago, actually, and it was a bird. It was an actual bird laying on the beach, and everybody walking around that thought the bird had died. And so they began to, you know, just hit it with their finger to see if there was any life in the bird. And finally, somebody said, well, just give me a bottle of water. So the bird is laying there on the beach, and then they just took this bottle of water and began to pour it on the bird. And for a minute there, it didn't move. And then they poured it again. And before you know it, it just started having this life because it just needed water. Everybody thought it was dead, but all it needed was some water. And I thought about how the water of the word is what gives us life. There's many times in our life, all we need is a ready word in season for it to encourage us. And I think about so many times in my life where, you know, I remember one instance where I was going through a depression and I had stayed out of work and I was watching TV on Lifetime and, oh, you know, yeah. <laughs> watching TV just, you know, in that mode, you know, I'm like, God, I just don't know if I want to just go through this anymore. And at the end of the movie, I'll never forget, I don't know what the movie was about, but the scripture from Ecclesiastes came up, God makes everything beautiful in his time. And I'm like, what in the world did that have to do with that Lifetime movie? But I saw it as God talking to me. That's what I needed. I needed that water to bring me back to life. And it happened so many times. You know, I remember all these other instances where I would see a bumper sticker or something just to remind me that water that I needed. Don't give up. Strengthen those things that remain, meaning strengthen those, the word that's already in you. When I wanted to say, you know, I'm not going to that church, I don't want to be around no church people. I don't want to see no church people. Because I felt like, you know, they were the one causing my pain and my problems. But God always had a way. And he would revive me with a word. I can be, you know, walking in the mall and I see somebody's t-shirt and it's like the Lord is speaking directly to me and I'm like, I cannot get away. So again, when you're thinking about strengthening the things that remain, remember God always knows where to find you. That was my saying for him. It doesn't matter where I try to run from him, he always knows where to find you. And even when you can't strengthen yourself, he knows how to get to you. 
to give you a ready word in season to give you that life. You know, that's all that bird needed was just a little bit of life, somebody to believe that he can live. And most of the time, people will look at us and say, there's no hope. Let it die. Let it die. She's gone. But no, we have to remember that God is the one that gives us life, and he will strengthen us. But when he does, we have to be able to receive that, that word of life, the word of life that comes to strengthen those things that we still have in us. You know, I tell people all the time, until the breath leaves your body, you still have hope. Don't give up on anybody. It could be the worst person, but until the breath leaves their body, that's always hope. And that's the way we have to look at our lives when it comes to strengthening those things that remain. You may feel like I'm unusable. You know, I can't do anything in the body of Christ. There's still hope. And you can strengthen your faith if nothing else. You, you know, it reminds me about um, what the Lord said to, to Peter. How many of you know what it's like to come short of what God wants you to do? Or to, to miss the mark. Now, missing the mark simply means sin. How many of you know what it's like as a believer to miss the mark? Now, we got some believers who are so self-righteous, they never do anything wrong. And I'm not talking to you. You go ahead and you wait. You can just go ahead and turn the TV off or turn the radio, whatever. I'm not talking to you. But I know what it's like to come short. I know what it's like to do my very best and still miss the mark. The thing that I appreciate about that, though, he told them, he said, strengthen what remains. And, you know, as I look at that, I see it a little different than most folks see it. Because I see it the way the Lord talked to Peter. The Lord told Peter, he said, you're going to deny me. Peter said, no, Lord, he said, I'm ready to die for you. He said, no, no. He said, you're going to deny me. I can tell you that you're going to deny me. And uh, a rooster's going to let you know that you've denied me. But he said something that has stuck with me for many years, and it always comes back to me when I'm not flat on my face. He said, but I prayed for you that your faith fail not. Jesus was telling this church, he said, your faith is about to fail. You need to strengthen what's left. How many of you know what it's like to be in such a position in what you're going through in life that all you got is just a little small piece of faith. I mean, you're ready to throw in the towel, you're ready to give up, you're ready to let go, you're just fed up, and there's just something inside. You know, it's almost like it's, it's so small that you, you really, it's almost like you can't even notice it, but it's there. That's that, that prayer that Jesus prayed for us. Jesus, remember, you may fail with your works, you may fail with your intent. You may fail with what God commanded you to do. But don't ever let your faith fail. Don't ever get to a point where you say to heck with the Lord Jesus, I don't believe in you no more. Don't ever do that. Never, never, never. Don't ever do that. Listen to me. Don't ever get to a point and place where you're going to say, I'm done. I quit. And you really quit. Now, you can say I quit. You can say I'm done. But listen, I can tell you right now, when you say all those words, there's a little spark inside of you. There's a little flame inside of you. It's just, it's just flickering just a little bit. Don't blow it out. Yes. Why? Because the Lord has prayed for you. And the Lord has prayed not that you don't have failures in this life, but he's prayed to you that your faith don't fail. Don't ever stop believing in the Lord. Don't ever stop believing that, Lord, no matter how low you get in this life, say, Lord, I'm just not going to give up. I told the Lord one time, I said, Lord, you know what? There may not even be a heaven. There may not, you may not even be there, but I still believe you are. And since I believe you are, I'm going to trust you. Yes. Whatever this is going on with my, me in my life, Lord, you're going to work this thing out. I trust you, Lord. I can't do it no more. I can't fight it no more. I can't take it no more. But, Lord, my faith is still in you. And, Lord, I can do like Job. Though you slay me, yet will I save you. you got to get an attitude. See, because you're going to get knocked down. Don't you dare, as a believer, think you're going to live your life and never come short. We are not perfect yet, but God is working on us. 
And while God's working on us, you get knocked down, you get pushed down, you get pushed aside. Somebody hate you, somebody mistreat you. Something goes wrong in your life. Hold on to your faith in God. He's real, darling. I wish I could get you to understand God is real. He's more real than we are. He's been here more longer than any of us have. And you cannot sign this and say, whatever they want to, we didn't come to it with a big bang. And we didn't come from animals. No, it can't be because there's too many things that, that happen with us that don't make no kind of common sense. All your, your skin is replaced every 24 hours. That doesn't make any sense to me. Think about it. You have something beating on the inside of you that you have never seen. How many of you have ever seen your heart? We, we live today and they can do heart bypass, but you still can't see your heart because they got you uh, sedated. You know, we believe we got a heart because it makes us alive. I believe in the Lord Jesus because he makes me alive. You got to understand that he's real. He's real, and he wants to love you. He wants to be a part of your life, and he wants you to pull him in and let 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 uh, let him be a part of your life. And he is a good God. What I've learned about him is he's not like man. Man has crucified me fifty times over. Man has hated me. Man has despised me. Man has forsaken me. Man has left me to my own self. God has never left me. When I'm about to die, when I feel like there's no life left, there's a spark. And it's almost like something hits against a fire coal inside of me, and there's a spark. And I focus on that spark. Lord, you got this. Lord, you said you'll never leave me nor forsake me. Lord, you said that, that I'm the head and not the tail. You said I'm above and not beneath because I obey you. And I said, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this. I'm going to get my tail back up and get back in the fight. Don't you ever give up. Don't you ever let go. You got somebody that created everything you can see, and he loves you. He looks out for us. He told this church here, he said to this church, he said, listen, you need to strengthen what you have left because there's something there. <coughs> you may be feel like I don't have anything that's redeemable, but the Lord died for every inch of you. Jesus died for every portion of you. And you're worth being redeemed because he said so. And he gave his life to prove it. And I can tell you by the grace of God, if I've got to give my life to prove it, I'm ready. You see, you got to understand this is nothing. I look at this life and this is nothing in comparison to what's on the other side. I've been to the other side. I've seen it. I know it's there. And I want to get back. Lord have mercy. I want to get back. Because I know this life is full of pain, full of suffering, full of all kind of troubles, all kind of travail. Over there, there is no trouble. When you transition, everything's over. There's nothing but reward for you when you transition over. So he's telling the church, you need to strengthen what's left. Because there is something left. I can't, I can't tell you it's all good, but I do know there is something left. And you need to strengthen what's left. Now we look at that next verse, 38. It says, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. And I want to read that first paragraph. It's worth mentioning. It says, Jesus outlines how to revive what is dead. This is the only way to implement structure and true revival in the church as well as individuals. Revival is not for the lost. They are the unborn dead. Revival is for the redeemed. Those who are born again and have fallen from their state of being spiritually alive. And remember, you know, we've heard the term, you know, my church is having a revival. And a lot of times in tradition, that's what your, your church would do, whether it was spring revival, fall revival, something that the pastor saw that was needed to revive the spark back into the saints. And one word that sticks out in this particular scripture is remember. You know, I think about even in today's vernacular, I have a very good memory. And, you know, it's almost photographic. But in those moments when I'm trying to get my spirit right, trying to get through my whatever I'm ha happening that day, I remember what God has already done. I'll remember all the things that 
he's done for me from, from years ago. And when I start to remember those things, it kind of brings me hope. It gives me life. And this is what he was telling him to do. He said, remember, therefore, how thou hast received, heard. And he says, hold fast to that and repent. And I wanted to read Lamentations 3. It's one of my favorite scriptures. But in this particular scripture, of course, Lamentations is, you know, with a bunch of crying and, you know, so many laments, whining about what's, what's going on. But in Lamentations 3, it says, it is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed. He says, because his compassions fail not, they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. So even though he was going through all of these things, he was remembering what God had already done. And he was remembering that God is faithful. He was remembering that God's mercies are new every morning. And this is what we have to do in our lives. We have to remember today might be bad, but tomorrow is a new day. And God's mercies are new every morning. And regardless of what I'm going through, remember how God brought you out the last time. He didn't let you die. <laughs> you know, remember how he provided the last time. It showed up right on time. So again, memory is good, especially when you remember what God has already done. Remember how excited you were when he first saved you. Remember how you were getting in the word and you were excited about all the things God was doing. And this is what he told this church. He said, remember all the things you learned, all the things you heard, and hold fast to those things. Don't let them go. They're invaluable. And that's what we have to do with the word of God in our lives. Don't let it go. Hold fast to them because that's what's going to keep us in our last days. Yeah, you know, there's something you said I think we need to, to, to actually emphasize again. Revival is not for the lost. Be real, real good. Again, revival is not for the lost. You cannot measure how great a revival your ministry has had by how many souls got saved. You miss the whole point of revival. If a person is not saved, they're dead. They don't need revival. They need resurrection. Revival is is just what it said, revives. Okay. It's amazing how many believers won't come to revivals because they believe it's for the lost. It's not. Revival is to revive those of us who've gone through a lot of things and maybe we're not for we we ought to be. Okay. You need to understand revival is for the saints, not for the sinners. I know that's going to rock somebody's boat, but it's the truth. <laughs> I mean, that's just the pure, unadulterated, naked truth. We're the ones that need revival, not the sinner. The sinner needs resurrection. We need reviving. So the next time your church has a revival, if you will believe, you need to get your behind there. You know, I don't care how strong you feel. I don't care how much you think you know. I don't care how much you think you are all that in a bad chip. Get your butt to the revival. It's for you. It's not for the sinner. Don't and 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 leaders stop bragging about how many souls got saved in the revival. Stop bragging about how many saints got revived. Start talking about how uh, how many got encouraged, got uplifted. Many times when we want a revival in our church, we want a hell and brimstone preacher. The preach the hell out of us. <laughs> you know, but you need to understand us. Okay. You okay? Okay, it's fine. She says, okay, it's okay. Yeah, but you gotta understand that we got more of that in the saints than we do in the sinners. <laughs> you need to understand we need some help. We need to get back on track. We need to get back refocused. So that's what revivals are for. We don't need a hell and brimstone preacher. We need a preacher to bring us mercy, bring us grace, bring us the word of God, the unadulterated word of God. We need something that's quick. We need something that's powerful. We need something that's sharper than a two-edged sword, even to the divine assembly of soul and spirit. We need the word. We need that unadulterated word. We need the desire to sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. Revival is for the saints. Revival is for the saints. Re Resurrection is for the sinners. 
And we need to understand that when we go to church. So stop staying out of your church because there's a revival. And stop bragging about how many got saved. Stop bragging about how many got restored. How many of them, how many of them were, were not where they, 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 they need to be, and now they have a new fire under them to do more for the Lord? Because that's what he told them. He said, you need revival. He said, you need to revive what's, what's, what's dying. What's about to die? This is what we need in the body of Christ. This Sardis church, he said, you know what? You guys are all messed up. He said, you just, just, as they used to tell me, no, you just weren't. <laughs> you know, you just all messed up. But he told me, he said, but you're not hopeless. What I love about God is you can be all messed up and still not be hopeless in his sight. He's still going to do whatever he needs to do to try to get you right. And that's all he's doing. You know, if, if the word don't hit you, then that means that you're almost dead. If you got any life inside of you at all, the word's going to hit you. And it's going to cause you to have to think about some things. Don't run. Don't hide. God is exposing you to you. See, we don't know one another, but the thing that's really the, the greatest and saddest thing is we don't know ourselves. We don't know what we're capable of because we never had anyone to take enough time with us to show us our faults and instead of beating us over the head with them, help us overcome them. That's what God does. God will take your life that's a mess and he'll straighten it right out. But he won't do it and, and, and for you. He won't do it standing beside you. He'll do it. He wants to work through you. God wants to help you come out. Because listen, God knows this. If he comes and just gets you out of your mess, then before you know it, you'll get back in your mess and be calling, well, come Jesus, come Lord, come help me. But, but if he takes a hold of you and leads you and guides you and helps you to make good choices, good decisions to come up out of whatever you're in, guess what? If it shows back up, you can handle it. See, that's what the devil loves. The devil loves when you call on the Lord and try to let the Lord do everything from the outside in. He, he loves, because he knows God's an inside job man. That's what God is. God works from the inside out. And he will not, he will not make you a puppet. He will not try to control and manipulate you. But he will teach you. He will train you. He will give you understanding. He'll help you to know why he wants you to do what he wants you to do. The thing I love about God is he will not make you do anything. If someone is making you do something, okay, Lord, I'm not going to say it. But let me just say this. God is not in the making you do something business. He's in the leading you into something's business. That means that he's going to get a hold of you and he's going to lead you deeper. He's going to take you to places that you never would even think or imagine. And when you look around, you're going to say, well, I don't know how I got here. You know what he's going to say to you? He said, I told you you can do all things through me because I strengthen you. Yes. See, we, we, we think that that scripture means that he's going to come in and do it for us. And, and we, we, we don't understand the word. How many of you have sung that song, come by here, Lord Jesus, come by here? How is he going to come by when he's inside of you? I mean, come on. We're, we're, we're expecting, Lord, if you don't show up, we're all going to be lost. I remember you used to be a song a long time ago, I'm going up the rough side of the mountain. And Lord, if you don't come to my rescue, we're all going to be lost. And I mean, it sounded good. I mean, it was a sweet song. It went to number one in the, in the chart. But guess what? That's not how God works. He don't come to your rescue. He's already rescuing you while you're in the middle of what you're going through. Because it's an inside job. He will give you the mindset and the understanding and the, 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 the means, the, the wisdom to come out of whatever you're in. And he will guide you out of it. If you'll trust him. Scripture said, trust in him with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. It says, acknowledge him in all your ways 
and your paths will be established. Darlings, that's the truth of God. That's the real God. Whenever you get ready to do anything, just whisper to him and say, Lord, is this the right thing to do? And don't just go ahead and do it anyway. Just wait a minute. You know, sometimes that one, one or two minutes of hesitation is all it takes for God to give you a revelation. One or two minutes of hesitation. Sometimes is all it takes for God to give you a revelation. Trust him. He'll do it. He said here in plain and simple words, he said, you need to revive what's, what's left. Mm -hmm. Now when you go to that B part, it says, if therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. So Jesus was revealing to them how he will, he will come upon those that are unwatchful and disobedient. So they were not just not praying, but they were also disobedient. And that's how we have to be careful. You know, when you think about a thief, when a thief comes, we don't know if he's coming, right? Mm -hmm. Because it, it, we, he wouldn't be a thief or she wouldn't be a thief if we knew they were coming. We sit there wait, waiting for him. So again, he's saying that he's going to come when they're unaware. But he also says, those that are unwatchful and disobedient. And remember, when you see those two words again, I thought about how it's hard to be um, unwatchful and obedient. If you are praying, meaning if you are praying, then you're most likely going to be obedient and not disobedient. It's only when you're not praying like you need to, you're not listening like you need to, when you're disobedient. And it's something that I often tell him sometimes, if I ever get upset with him, and if I ever see his face, then I'm like putty. You know, I'm like, oh God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why sometimes I don't even want to see him. I don't even want to look at him because I know if I look at him, then that's over. But it's the same principle when you're <laughs> It's the same principle, you know, as far as when you're praying like you need to, like you need to, you're going to be prone to be more, be obedient. But when you're not praying, when you're not watchful, this when disobedience comes in because you don't have any accountability. You don't have a relationship, so to speak. So you feel like, well, I can do what I want. So again, he lets them know, if you continue to be unwatchful, unprayerful, if you continue to be disobedient, I'm going to come as a thief in the night. You know, what I appreciate the most about it, again, like I said, you know, he's going to help you. Mm -hmm. God's going to help you be obedient if you want to. Yeah. You, it, it's got to be It's got to be your will. He will not make you be obedient. Man yes. Yes. makes you be obedient. Man gives you commands and demands and you better do this and you better do that. God will tell you, I'm going to set before you life and death. And he will say, you choose. But I'm going to tell you, if you choose to obey me, you're going to have life. If you choose to disobey me, you're going to have death. But I'm not going to choose for you. I'm not going to stand in a pulpit. I'm not going to stand in a place of authority and make you do anything. But he said, I'm going to give you a choice. Any ministry, any work, anything that has God's name on it and the Lord Jesus' name on it can't be a controlling and manipulating kind of ministry. But it has to be a ministry of grace, a ministry of love, a ministry that will tell you the truth about hell about damnation, but also will tell you the truth about heaven. They'll tell you the truth about dying, but they won't leave you in the deathbed. They will raise you up out of the deathbed and present to you the life which is in Christ. That's what it's all about. That's what God's all about. He told this church, he said, you need to understand if you'll just obey me, things are going to be right. Things are going to get better. He told me, he said, in that next week, he said, there's a few names uh, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. What do you mean they haven't defiled their garments? What do you mean they haven't defiled their garments? Well, I thought the devil made me do it. You no, know, I, I thought I couldn't help myself because I just, I hope my daughter had to do it. No, no, dog, you don't understand. You dirty yourself up. And guess what? You got to clean yourself up. Somebody said, well, uh oh, here we go. How am I going to clean myself up? You got to be washed with water by the word. How are you, what are you talking about? What? 
this is what Jesus said. He said, husbands, love your wives, even as I love the church and gave myself for it, that I might present it to myself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. I love what it says in Romans and also is in Corinthians and also in several of the other New Testament books. It says this, you need to put on the new man, put off the old man, put on the new man. He makes a statement. He said, listen, you need to stop lying. <laughs> you know, I mean, he said, put away lying, put away deception, put away evilness. Overcome evil with good. You got to do this. Listen to me, darlings. You know what? I found out I can still lie when I came to the Lord. It shocked me. But I can still do it. I mean, I was in shock. I said, what was that? And, and the Spirit of God said, that was a whopper. <laughs> I said, well, Lord, I don't, I, I'm saying I'm not supposed to do that. Why did you let me do that, Lord? He said, you got to put that stuff away from you. Just like stealing. If you stole before you came to the Lord, guess what? You can still steal. Then what's going to prevent me from stealing? You got to use your understanding in the Lord and the Word of God to put it away from you. Stop. Stop doing what you're doing. Stop. Don't say I got a right to do it because somebody else did me wrong. I don't say I got a right to do it because I got to take care of myself. You don't have those kind of rights. In the Lord, he said, vengeance is mine. I will really pay. He said in his word that we've got to trust him to take care of us. It does not mean I'm going to lay down and let you beat me half to death. I mean, I got two feet. I can walk away. I can run. You know what I mean? Somebody said, well, well why are they still trying to catch it? Run! <laughs> run, Forrest, run! <laughs> you got to understand, you know, whenever, whenever Joseph was in that place where this, 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 his master's wife was trying to, trying to you know, do, do with him, he, the Bible said he did what? He ran! He ran! He ran, 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 ran out of his clothes. <laughs> running away from somebody who's trying to take his clothes off of him. You know what I mean? You, you, you got to understand, God's not going to clean you up. You're going to clean you up. Well, how are you going to clean you up? 17th chapter of John's gospel says it this way. Jesus said this way. He said, you know what? He said, Father, he said, you continue to bless and keep them. And I'm paraphrasing. But he said, I have sanctified them. Through thy truth. Yes. Then he said, guess what? Thy word is truth. What does sanctify mean? Separate. Pull you apart. So what does that mean? Why do I, why do I need to know my Bible? Man, I love that preaching. I love that, I love that shouting, that praising God. I mean, that is where we really had church today. But what did you learn? I learned how to shout a new shout. Uh, what, did you, what did you learn today? I learned how to speak a new language. Well, let me ask you a question. What you gonna do when the <laughs> I can't say that. What you gonna do whenever you get out of church? When that devil standing there and says, okay, you had your shout. Now that's now I'm glad you got that out. Now I'm gonna whip your tail. Come on. Put it up. What you gonna do? What you gonna do when you leave the church and go home to that devil of a spouse you got? Sometimes that devil of a spouse went with you to the church and they just they just was under restraint because of the word. Now you get out from under the word at the church, and they just, man, you don't even know who you went home with. No, I ain't not talking to some folks. And they don't know nobody. No, 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 no. We don't have that going on in the church. But I'm just telling you, God is not going to clean you up without you cleaning you up with what God's given you. He's giving you the word. It, it sanctifies, it cleans. He said, put away lying, put away stealing. He was not talking to the sinners. He was talking to the saints. He said, put on the new man who created like Christ. How am I going to put on the new man if I don't know about the new man? How am I going to do it if I'm not being taught? How am I going to do it if somebody's not telling me? You mean to be telling me that I've got love? 
I'm still trying to get love. No, you already got love. I'm trying to get peace. No, you already got peace. I'm trying to get some joy. No, you already got joy. I'm trying to get some patience. No, no, you already got patience. I'm trying to get some temperance. You already got temperance. Well, where is it at then? It's on the inside of you. What do you mean? God said it this way. He said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, temperance. And he went on and said, uh, he said there's no law against that. It's already in you. Well, if it's in me, I sure can't feel it because you're not allowing it to grow. And you're trying to grow one piece of fruit without the other piece of fruit. It didn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It said the fruit of the Spirit. One fruit. Well, what kind of fruit is that? It's a holy fruit. Well, yes. what kind of fruit is it? It's the Holy Spirit inside of you. Yes. You already got love. You already got peace. You already got lonesome. You already got temper. Well, why don't I? I why can't I experience Because you haven't been taught about it. Somebody told you you need to pray for it. Somebody told you you need to run and pursue it. Somebody said you need to go through a lot of hell so you can have some patience. No, you don't. It's already in you. Then how am I going to get it out of me? By being patient. Oh. <laughs> 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 no, we <it's> are going. <laughs> Too many of God's people are trying to find something they already got. They just hadn't been taught about it. <laughs> he said the works of the flesh, you know, that's adultery, fornication, lying, stuff. These are works of the flesh. You got to work that stuff. Work that thing, man. Work that thing. Work that thing. You got to work the flesh. But you don't have to work the fruits of the Spirit. Because the fruit of the Spirit comes with the Holy Spirit. Somebody said, well, I thought that was what I do. I mean, that's what I shout with. That's what I speak with new tongue with. Darling, you just don't know. My shoe got a tongue, but it doesn't keep my feet warm and help me out if you don't have a soul with it. Uh-oh. It's got a soul. Not yet. <laughs> Woo-hoo. <laughs> I did <it> again. <laughs> But you need to understand, darling, we're focusing too much on the shoestrings and on the tongue and all that other stuff. We need the soul. We need the leather. We need to understand that God has put it all inside of us. It's already there. We just haven't been taught it. You know, we're still going by, come by here, Lord Jesus, come by here. Holy Spirit, come down. I want to come by. I'm behind the curtain. What curtain? My Bible tells me that whenever Jesus was resurrected, said the curtain was torn from the top down. There is no other or no more holy of holies separating us. All is holy. Somebody said, well, I want to be when the, under the spout when the glory comes out. Well, then, you, it's a fountain. Jesus said you have inside of you a river of living water. It ain't showering down like a spout. It's flowing in you like a river. Come on, darling. You, you, you got to understand this is word. This is the truth. Somebody missed the memo that said when the Holy Spirit comes inside of you, he's more than a shout. He's more than a tongue. He's more than a hopping, a hollering, a running. And get this. A lot of us were trying our very best to, to say, well, I need some good preaching. Well, the Bible said the Great Commission doesn't say a word about preaching. It said, go ye into all the world and do what? Teach. Teach. Teach what? Teach them to observe everything whatsoever I have commanded you. That's right. Come on, darlings. When you really get into it, we need a checkup. I won't say from the neck up. I won't need some to feed up. <laughs> now that latter part of the verse, that's what he told them that they have not defiled their garments. He said, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. And then he says, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. 
And it's one scripture I wanted to read, and it's in your notes, but it blesses me every time I read it. It's in Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 through 17, concerning the wife, the, those that have not defiled their garments. It says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man could number, of all nations, kindred, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And it says, All the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessings and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of water, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And that's such an encouragement, you know, in this world to know that one day, you know, at the end of all this, we won't hunger anymore, we won't thirst anymore. And more importantly, he's going to wipe away all tears from their eyes, the ones that are clothed in white. That's some encouragement to want to get to that next spot, to want to be in that position with God when there's no more worry, no more pain. So this is the ones he was talking about, the remnant, the ones that have not defiled their clothes, the ones that he is not going to blot out. They're going to be written in the book of life. So we have something to look forward to. You know, in this world, we may not have things that, you know, go our way, but we have something to look forward to in the next life, that there's not going to be no more tears. And we're going to cry tears on this on this side, whether it be pain or lack or whatever the case may be. But that's encouraging to me to always remember that one day, God is going to walk away all our tears. And you know, the thing that's interesting is the fact that he said, they that overcome. The only way to overcome is to go through. The only way to overcome is to go through. Now, I'm going to say this, and I know it's not popular today, but it's the truth. If you are a believer, it's not going to be peaches and cream, sugar and spice, and everything nice. You're going to go through some things. But the key is, you're going to be able to overcome it. And you get stronger by overcoming it. I love looking at sports. And you know, the thing that I appreciate about sports is every one of the great sportsmen has overcome something. And and that didn't destroy them, but it made them. Some of the greatest people you will ever meet are those who went through some of the most horrible things and they overcame. Do not receive a gospel that says you're never gonna have to suffer. Do not receive a gospel that says you're never gonna be in pain. Do not receive a gospel that says you're never going to go through some things. Because the good news comes as you overcome what you go through. And you're going to overcome. It's not going to defeat you. But you got to recognize where the power is. Jesus said you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And we all have the Spirit of God. So we are all overcomers. And you need to understand, he said it this way. Every time he closed out these different churches, he made a statement. He said, he that had ears to hear, let him hear. You know what that says to me? This was not just for them. It's also for us. Do you have ears to hear? Then God's speaking to you. And you got to understand, when it comes to serving him, you're not going to always win 
the fight. But you already won the war. It don't matter how many fights you lose. What really matters is, are you winning the war? Or has the war been won? It already has. Jesus won the war. All he tells us to do is, he says, just fight. He said, you can do whatever you need to do because I'm your strength. He said, if you can believe all things are possible to them that believe them, he said, it's a done deal. He said, if you have the faith like I have and believe like I believe, he said, and believe in me, he said, then the works that I do shall you do also. And even greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. He said, hitherto you prayed for nothing in my name, but for hitherto he said, you, whatever you pray for or ask for in my name, I will give it you. I'm crazy enough to believe that he said it. He's going to do it. Somebody said, well, I don't see you all prosperous and stuff because you're looking at the outside. You're not looking at the inside. But inside of me, there's a, there's a, a strength that man can't take away. Inside of you, there's a strength that man can't take away. Inside of me, there's a purpose. There's a destiny. I know where I'm going. I know what the future holds. I don't have to wonder whether I've got to depend on man or not to paint a good future for me. My future has already been signed, sealed, and delivered in the Lord Jesus. Your future is already done. Your destiny is already fulfilled. All you got to do now is go through the motions the way God teaches you to go through the motions, and it all is going to be all right. Because listen to me, I don't care what you got in this life, you're not taking it across the river. I know some folks believe that you need to cross the Jordan River to go to heaven. Well, I got news for you. The only thing that's going to cross the river is what you're laying up in heaven. And what he said, where your heart is, there will your treasures be also. When you love Jesus, you're laying up treasures in heaven. What are treasures in heaven? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, meekness, temperance. As he gave it to us, guess what we do? Give it to everyone else. Right. And as we give it to everyone else, we're laying up treasures. I love what the scripture says. It said, if your enemy hungers, feed him. He said, love your enemies. You can't do that without the Lord. I'm serious. You can't do it. You got to have Jesus. You got to yes. have the Lord. Yes. He said, do good to those who despitefully use you. You pray for them. How many of you like being used? I don't. I've been used a whole bunch in life. And man, there are times I just really want to get back at it. And you know what the Lord always tells me? He said, I got this. He said, don't worry. They will prosper. Don't worry. When they, when they think that they got you, he said, that's when I come through. So I, I'm okay with that. You know, you got to understand, this church didn't have no bragging rights at None. But the Lord did say something that really makes me wonder. You know, he has some things that make you go, hmm. He said, be careful because you don't want me to blot your name out of the book. Yeah. Now, I didn't say that. He did. So, it is possible <clears throat> To have your name blotted out of the book. It's, it's in the word. I, I, can't, I can't argue with that. It's in the Bible. Yep. You can have your name blotted out of the book. Yep. How do you how can you say that? You know, you just don't. This is in red in your Bible. This is the Lord talking here. Jesus said that. When they came back in the 10th chapter to look rejoice because the devil was subject unto them, Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. He said, and I give you power over all the power of the enemy. But he said, you don't need to be rejoicing because I've given you the power. He said, you need to be rejoicing because your name is written in the book. Yet he told this church at, at, at Sardis, he said, be careful. 
Because if you don't get this thing together, I'm going to block your name out of the book. Somebody's going to say, if once your name's written in the book, it can't be taken out. Well, you need to argue with Jesus about that. Because he said it can. Yes. I mean, it's, it's there. That's a wrap.